couple of things before I, starting back in the material. Just to, um, my my office hours start this afternoon three three to five. So I'll be in Aldrin Cafe if you've got questions about anything uh, we, we've been talking about or otherwise. Uh, I also plan to put the first of the problem sets up later today. Um, it'll be due a week from Wednesday. So it's just conceptual questions, trying to make sure that you sort of are, are learning the material that I'm trying to convey and um, essentially test yourselves to, to an extent. Uh, did, did you get it? Any, any questions about class issues, getting settled, logistics type things? OK. Um, I, I feel like I've done justice to the whole, to, to skating and really the story of inertia and acceleration. I, I, I got that fairly well, I think. Um, the last tidbits I wanted to, to do, right, and I could summarize it all, but I'll just, I'll, the last tidbits I want to do is, with skating were just to, to point out that I, I've tried to introduce five physical quantities, uh, things that, there, that you can, in principle, you can measure, spe specify about about a situation, for example, skating. Uh, there, three of them involved, well, were related to position. Position's where you are, of course, and I told you it's a vector quantity. It also has a reference point. You have to, you, you have to say, basically, starting with the reference, how do you get to, where the, to the position you have in mind? Uh, velocity was just the, the, the rate at which position is changing with time. Pretty straightforward to see. Acceleration is the rate at which velocity is changing with time, and that's tougher to see, because you actually have to watch the movement and see if the movement is changing. Any questions about position, velocity, acceleration? Um, the other two quantities were force and mass. Forces cause acceleration. Their purpose, you know, a purpose in, for, the, for their existence is, is causing accelerations. Uh, the, the simple name is push or pull. The units, I, so it's part of the, my reason to have the slide up here is to, is to point out the units in the, in the SI or metric system. In the US, probably be, be 30 generations before we eventually drift to the metric system. It's unbelievably hard to, to, to do it. Um, so position is measured in meters. I, I'll flip back and forth because meters are unfamiliar to many of you, and you'll, say, you'll go, "What's a meter?" Uh, so you know, th that's a foot, and that's about a meter. All right, uh, position's measured in meters because it's a distance from a, a reference point along with a direction. Velocity is in, measured in meters per second because it's the rate at which a position is changing with time. So it's it's got a distance divided by a time aspect to it. That's the meters per second. Acceleration has the strange unit of meter per second per second, because it's the change per second of a velocity, which itself is meters per second. So it's meters per second per second, or just meters squared. Meters per second squared. All right? Do you need to know how to deal with units? Rarely. But just I, I, I ought to pass them by you at least once. So OK with the, the, the position, velocity, acceleration units, more or less? Or questions about that? Um, the unit of force. You're all used to the unit of force being pounds. Um, you, you, if, if somebody pushed on you with a force of a pound, you probably have a, a, a sense of what that's like. Because if you hold a pound of sugar in your hand, you're pushing up on it with a force that's a pound. So it's pushing down on you with a force that's a pound also. The, the SI unit, or metric unit of, of force, is a Newton, named after Sir Isaac. And a Newton is about the weight of a small apple. So if you imagine holding a small apple. Yeah, I know this was my little jokey thing here, right? Uh, if you small, hold a small apple in your hand, and you feel that push, that's, that's about a Newton of force. And the last unit of, of the, the last physical quantity I talked about, the unit of it, is the unit of mass, and that's the kilogram which also you ought to have some experience with at this point. A liter of water has about a, the mass of one kilogram, meaning that if you try to shake it, it's got that resistance to acceleration corresponding to one kilogram of mass. And if you want to think, you know, where did the force, the, the unit of force come from? Where did the Newton come from? It's actually a composite unit. It is not a fundamental unit the way uh, meter is defined uh, 
it, it used to be defined according to a, an artifact. It, there was a one meter stick around. Uh, it's now defined as related to, to light and how many wavelengths, a very specific light and a, and a very specific number of wavelengths of that light. So it's, it's, it's defined uh, at sort of a fundamental level. Um, kilogram, uh, they're working on defining that at a fundamental level. It is an artifact at present in France. There is the, the kilogram and the kilogram siblings. Um, but having chosen the meter, chosen the kilogram, actually this, the second is also defined in a fundamental way. Um, and this is way beyond what you need to know. Uh, that those, th those three units are, are fundamental ones. Um, and from that, you, the Newton is, is handed to us by Newton's second law. If, if you exert a force that we will call a Newton, on an object that has a, kil a, ma a mass of one kilogram, it will accelerate at one meter per second squared. That defines how hard you have to push, and that therefore defines the Newton. Hopefully that made some sense. Any questions about that? Do I care if, you, if it's stuck? No, I'll never test you on it, but I told you. you know, I told you once, and there it is. Okay, so anyway, there, there are five, the five uh, fundamental five physical quantities I wanted to introduce initially, and a little bit about their units. Why do we need units is because if you're going to, if you're going to say that I'm, I'm a certain distance from reference point zero here, uh, you, so you're trying to pin down my position, you can't just say 17. You know, 17 watts. He's 17 away from it. Ah, well, 17 of, you know, I'm trying to think of some jokey name for, for this unit. A unit this long, which has a name, I don't know, Fred's. These are Fred's. I'm 17 Fred's away from that. Um, if we all agree on what a Fred is, it's that, it's that much, we're good. But who, who knows what, you know, it's, it's not going to get outside this room, mostly. So let's stick with units that everyone has, has agreed on. That's a foot. We all agree on that. How many of them am I away? About eight of those things. So that's the, the purpose of fundamental units. A pur purpose of units is to allow us to, to exchange information and, and talk about physical quantities uh, and understand what, how, much each, your, how much you have in mind and uh, have in mind myself. All right. Any questions about units, things you wonder about units? I'll stop my meander here. OK, so I'm, I feel like I'm done enough about skating and will. Lost one of my video screens up here, so I'm, on a, I'm working on a one screen computer, which is fine. Falling balls. So the story of skating was, was by and large the story of coasting. In the absence of forces, uh, I brought up forces in order to allow the skater to start, stop, and turn, but I didn't specify what the forces were. Just that, you know, if you push on a skater, the skater will accelerate. Or um, assuming no one else pushed back, if, if the only force acting on the skater was my push, the skater's going to accelerate. Might slow down, might speed up, might turn. Now, in falling balls, I'll, I'll bring in the first force. Uh, the force I have in mind is the force associated with gravity. And it turns out that every object here near the surface of the Earth develops a force due to gravity that we call that object's weight. So that's what weight means. Your weight is the force that the Earth's gravity exerts on you. It happens to be straight down toward the center of the Earth, and it's a certain amount. Uh, as we'll see shortly, it, it has the remarkable feature that it is exactly proportional to your mass. So if two of you differ in mass by a factor of two, strangely enough, you differ in weight by a factor of two. And you might think mass and weight are the same thing. They're not. Mass is the resistance to acceleration. How hard it is to shake something, to make it go toward you, away from, toward you, away from, toward you, away from. Right, that's, that's mass. Weight is how hard gravity pulls down on something. It's another different quantity. So that's, that's where we're headed, uh, talking about weight and trying to distinguish it from mass and find what weight's influence is like on things. All right, so. First question I have, just to sort of start things off, is suppose I throw a ball upward into the air, and the story doesn't start until the ball leaves my hand. So if I throw the ball up, 
up in the air, and not yet, not yet. Now, while it's still going upward, the question is, is there any force pushing the ball upward? We're, we're neglecting anything through the air. You okay with the question? How many think that yes, there is a force pushing upward on the ball? How many think no, there's no force pushing upward on the ball? Ooh, we're getting a, a vast majority are going for no force pushing upward on the ball. Well, then why does the ball keep going upward? You tell me. Inertia. Inertia. Yeah. You, the, the correct answer to this question, so, you know, it's, it's, this sort of question is the ideal version is when, when it's 50-50 among, among voting, as in people really aren't sure. Mo, the mo majority of you are, are sure that there is no upward force pushing on the ball, and that's true. Once the ball leaves my hand, there's no force pushing up on it. It continues upward, not because something's pushing on it, but because nothing is stopping it, or at least not enough. It keeps going because that's its nature. It's inertial. Or well, it's trying to be inertial. It's, it actually isn't fully inertial in the sense that it does have a force acting on it. Force due to gravity. It's weight. All right? So it keeps going. Uh, if, if, we, if we got rid of gravity, if I just could flip a switch, no gravity, and I got it started going upward, it would do the inertial trick. Do, 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 do. It would go, it would go straight and true, steady, you know, equal distances and equal times, all the way to the ceiling, and then the ceiling would interfere. All right? The fact that there is gravity means that it doesn't quite pull that off. It's having trouble. All right, so some observations about falling balls. If you drop it, and, and I, I, I tend to use sort of, is it physicist jargon or is it, physics educator jargon, I'm not sure. But I drop it from rest, which is just shorthand for you. Start with it motionless and let go. When you do that, it starts with no, first of all, well, you see its position. There it is. And right now its velocity is zero, right? It's not going anywhere. And incidentally, if you get, remember, velocity's got an amount and a direction. Well, when the amount is zero, the direction doesn't matter. So there's no direction to it. It's a special case, uh, not important. But so there it's got velocity zero, but if I let it go of it, it acquires more and more downward velocity. It's going faster and faster in the downward direction. So its velocity is going from zero to a little bit downward to a lot downward and so on. Um, that's, that's for dropped from rest. If I toss it straight up, you know, it, it sort of has two identifiable parts to its journey. After it leaves my hand, and I, I keep saying, you know, it's after it leaves my hand, while I'm playing with it, my hand, I'm exerting forces on it, and that messes up the story. Okay, so we, we'll get it out of my hand. Now it's going upward because I got it started upward. It's got inertia. It's going to keep, you know, it's going to keep doing what it was doing. Uh, it will rise higher and higher. Uh, it will come momentarily to a stop, and momentarily is truly a moment. There's only one instant uh, of, no, of no length in time at which it's motionless, and then it'll, then it'll resume, will continue its journey downward, as though I were up there and had just dropped it. So, so the second half of its, of its journey is indistinguishable from somebody being up there letting go of it. You can make, you know, if you're making a budget movie and you have already filmed somebody dropping it from up there, you can just use that footage. Okay? Uh, anything else? That's, that's what you observe. And last thing to talk about, the last line there is, suppose you don't throw it straight up. Suppose you throw it at an angle. Well then, can't talk and catch at the same time. Um, then it travels in an arc. It, 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 it does go upward for a while. It never gets motionless. It, it gets to a peak, but even at the peak, it's still moving to your right. And then it comes down in an arc. And you may well have encountered the, this arc. Uh, people talking about it, it's, it's parabolic. It, it, it takes the shape of a parabola. If you remember a parabola back from geometry, that happens to work out that way. It's not, you know, from perspective of this class, is not so important. 
but you're so used to this. If you've ever played catch of any sort, you know these arcs. You've, you've lived with them. You know where to stand for the thing to come to. Um, we've learned by, by experience and practice to predict where things go extremely well or, or, or well enough. I mean, if you're a good catch, you can predict it really well. If you're a mediocre catch like me, you know, if you can't get it well enough, oh, got me, you know, hit me again. Um, but the, we're doing the physics of it. We can actually predict where it's going to be. Air messes things up a bit, but, but we can, we'll, we'll neglect air for the day. It just, uh, it just adds a, a layer of compli complication that's not important for now. All right, so some questions to pursue in looking at how falling balls work, how they fall, why they fall, what they do. Uh, the first one of which is why do they fall at all? So why does a dropped ball fall downward? And the answer to that is that it does experience a force. The force is due to, the, is, is due to gravity, the Earth's gravity in particular, and that's downward and it gives the ball a weight. So uh, just to be, be clear about it, the force due to gravity on the ball is the ball's weight. They're exactly the same idea. So um, if, if I use one or the other, or if you use one or the other, we're talking about the same thing. This ball has a weight. It has it now. You, it can't get rid of it. In principle, it can get rid of it by leaving the Earth. Um, what I will talk about today involves a little bit of approximation in the sense that we're going to talk about life here at the surface of the Earth, playing with balls and throwing balls and stuff like that. Uh, the force of gravity in this limited context is wonderfully constant, and right toward the center of the Earth, the ball's weight is the ball's weight is the ball's weight. If, just having set that aside for a moment, if we're allowed to, to really move big distances, the top of a mountain, uh, go to the equator of the Earth, or the, or, the, or the North Pole of the Earth, or even to the moon, now we're going to be able to change the ball's weight because we're going to change the local strength of gravity. So, so just to point out, this is a little, you know, it, it's, a, it's a very good approximation. It's not perfect. The force, the, the only gravitational force that matters for all practical purposes is due to the Earth, and it's straight down. All right? Uh, what else? Okay, so, so if I throw this ball and basically get it out of my hand, and we're neglecting the air again, then the only thing, the ball isn't touching anything, um, the, the ball is acted on, not, so nothing's touching it. It turns out the ball can be acted on even through empty space by gravity, and that's the only thing acting on it, its weight. And if a ball is experiencing only one force, its weight, well then, the net force on it, that is the sum of all the forces acting on it, is its weight. It's going to accelerate, right? Forces cause accelerations. So that means that its velocity will change with time. That's what an acceleration is. And that's exactly what we're seeing. If I drop a ball and I start with it at rest, velocity zero, and I let go of it, its velocity doesn't stay zero. Its velocity changes with time. And the amount by which it changes in time has to do with the force acting on it, which is its weight, divided by its mass, which is you know, a little mass. You know, well, well under a kilogram. So it's got a, it's got a modest weight downward pulling on it, and it's got a modest resistance to acceleration, its mass, and so it accelerates at a certain rate. Psh, down it goes. Questions about that? And I, I, I'm making it simple, trying not to be um, simple without, without being condescending. I, I, I'm trying to, to make sure you all can follow the, the details here. Anyhow, uh, that begs the question, how about different balls? If I drop two clearly different balls at the same time, which one will hit the ground first? Hey, how many think that the baseball will hit the ground first? How many think the basketball will hit the ground first? How many think they'll hit at the same moment? Ooh, you're good. Ready? Get set. Same moment. 
Well, that's odd because this one, I mean, I'm actually not going to do the experiment. You know why, okay? It happens by accident every year or two or three where this, this guy rolls off the table. It's never fun. All right, so if I drop these guys together, they'll hit the ground together. And so this, the, the reason for, for what I just did is I want, a, I want a very dramatic difference between the two balls' mass. Ooh, and between the two balls' weight and their mass and their weight. Oh, they're different in two ways. That's interesting, okay? <laughs> now, now I'm being goofy. Okay, I'll stop. Um, you're allowed to laugh with me or at me. It's okay, as long as it's uh, for pedagogical reasons. So this ball has a small weight compared to, to this ball. So if, if the only difference between these two balls was their weight, of course, the, the red bowling ball pulled down much harder, would accelerate much faster, would pick up speed and get to the floor way ahead of the baseball. So if weight were the only difference between these two, uh, these two balls, the bowling ball would get there first. All right? Well, how about mass? This baseball, because it has a, it's got a tiny mass, if the only difference between these two balls were their masses, this guy accelerates so easily. The baseball would clearly accelerate faster, get to the floor first. Well, what if they differ in both weight and mass? Which, of course, they do. Then, although the baseball is pulled down gently, and that would let it, dra it would dawdle, it has a small mass, so it doesn't dawdle. It responds easily to a small force. The two of them go down together. They both experience exactly the same acceleration, despite their differences in mass and their differences in weight. It, so, so now I'll ask for, for real if you've got questions about that. I hope I've gotten that across cleanly. Any questions? The idea that they differ in two physical quantities that are different, weight and mass. Okay, well, because they differ in two different uh, quantities like that, the, the, uh, the observation we're having is that um, the bowling ball has a larger mass and a larger weight, and in order for it to accelerate exactly together with the baseball, which it does, there has to be a very steady uh, relationship between the weight of a ball and the mass of the ball. And that's what I've drawn up here on this, this relationship here. If you take any of the balls that are up here you, and you weigh them, and you take the same ball and you measure its mass, which you do not by putting it on a scale, but by shaking it conceptually. It's hard to measure mass, actually, directly, because you really want to watch how it accelerates, which is hard to measure. But you can do it. It's, uh, if you take the ball's weight and the ball's mass and divide them, you keep getting the same um, value. It, the value is, not here, here on the surface of the Earth specifically, it's about 9.8 newtons of force for every kilogram of mass. So this guy's got a little, a little weight, a little mass. You make the division, 9.8 newtons of, of weight per, per kilogram of, of mass. You do it for the, big, for the big bowling ball, same thing, same factor every time. Uh, this, this observation that, that every kilogram of mass here on this Earth's surface always develops 9.8 newtons of, of weight uh, is a, it's, it's a remarkable thing. It didn't have to be that way. I mean, you, one could imagine a universe in which it isn't. The fact that it is true in our universe uh, led to many interesting thoughts, which eventually drifted into to Einstein's head as, as his theory of general relativity, the, 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 the observation that... Uh, that gravity warps space and so on, which is way beyond what we'll ever do. But um, it didn't have to be this way, so it, but it is, okay? So, so every kilogram of mass here at the Earth's surface develops 9.8 newtons of weight. And as a result, choose any ball you like, it's gonna develop just the right amount of weight to make it 
accelerate downward like every other ball, or people, or whatever. You know, jump off a diving board, you do the same thing. Um, for the online version of the class that I did a long ago, I was throwing all kinds of stuff out the window of the third floor of this building, bowling balls included. And at one point then, I, you know, I, you know, I, I wanted to throw the viewers off together so, so they would also go. So I threw a camera over. So the camera watches the balls, everything falls together. They all go down together, including the camera. I protected the camera, it, didn't, it wasn't injured, okay? But uh, everything falls together is the main point. Questions about that idea? All right. Well, I'm mean, having said this now, uh, okay, I'm gonna ask this question. A large coin, small coin, uh, compare the coins. I've got, I've got four choices here. I've got the quarter has the same mass, I mean, the, the quarter has more or less mass, the dime has more or less ma uh, weight. Um, how many think that, A, the quarter has the same mass and the same weight as a dime? How many think that a quarter has the same mass but more weight than a dime? How, many, how about a quarter has more mass but the same weight as a dime? Boy, you're <laughs> this is a tough question. D, how many think that a quarter has more mass and more weight than a dime? Yes, thank you, thank you. It's all, yeah, good. So they go together. That said, now this is one of the, the, the messiest equation, probably the whole semester, this is probably the messiest one I'll put up for the whole semester. But it's, it's make, it, where it's going, this view graph is going to the observation that everything falls together Acknowledge? Can I acknowledge it? Acknowledge. Here. <laughs> All right. That was an added degree of complexity to this view graph. Where this is going is it's making the observation that everything falls together and has a very specific acceleration. Remember, acceleration has, you, it's a physical quantity, meaning you can measure it, and I've got more information now. Um, so you can measure acceleration. It has units meters per second squared in the SI system. It turns out everything here near the Earth, Earth's surface, if you drop it, it accelerates downward at a, at a specific acceleration, 9.8 meters per second squared. In, in, in uh, English system, it's, it's uh, 32 feet per second squared. So that's a specific acceleration. Um, just to, push, to, to give you an idea of what it is, you've seen it happen all your life and drop, seeing things fall. But let me, do, let, let me try one, one meter per second squared. Can I even do this? One meter per second squared is probably about like that. All right, I'm trying to sort of measure off meters and, and, and hit them at the right moments. So it's pretty fast acceleration. You know, you know this, you've watched things fall, you know that there's not a lot of time between the vase going off the balcony and you're needing to catch it before it smashes. It's just not gonna take much time. But it's a specific amount. It turns out that everything falls at that same specific amount. Where did the 9.8 meters per second come from? Uh, it came from the following. First off, we, if, the first equation up there is, is, is simply Newton's second law, the observation that forces cause accelerations, and if you take a certain force acting on an object with a certain mass, and it's gonna be a ball in this case, so the, pick the force on the ball divided by the mass of the ball, that gives you the acceleration of the ball. It predicts the, the, the acceleration of the ball. The force is the cause, the acceleration is the, the, uh, the consequence. Okay, well, Suppose instead of picking an arbitrary force, so it's not the force that I exert on the ball, it's the force that gravity exerts on the ball, well, that's the ball's weight. And we know what the ball's weight is because every kilogram of, here on the surface of the Earth develops one, uh, 9.8 newtons of weight. So the ball's weight is just 9.8 newtons for every kilogram the ball has. And if we put that in, 
we get the acceleration of a falling ball is simply the weight of the ball divided by the mass of the ball. And we know that, that, that uh, division, weight of the ball divided by the mass of the ball, that's, that's the division we get whenever we take any object and measure its weight and divide it by that object's mass. We always get 9.8 newtons per kilogram. There's, every kilogram develops 9.8 newtons of weight. That's just that same relationship again. So the acceleration of a falling ball, hopefully I've said this in a way that's followable, lose my own train of thought in my own head. Um, the acceleration of a falling ball is 9.8 newtons per kilogram. It's just that same relationship. The weight of an object divided by the mass of the object. Well, that seems a weird, weird units. Acceleration of a falling ball is 9.8 newtons per kilogram. What's, what's that? That's not an acceleration, is it? Well, it is. If you remember, I, I started off today pointing out that the Newton, which is the unit of force, is a composite unit. It's secretly built out of other units. And it, it goes back to Newton's second law. It's really built out of, what are they? <laughs> the units of acceleration and the units of mass. And when you, when you, when you substitute in those, those other pieces for Newtons, you end up with the acceleration of a falling ball, or anything else that's falling, being 9.8 meters per second squared, which is, a, which is the, the uh, prototypical unit of, of acceleration. The point is then, everything here near the Earth's surface <laughs> develops just enough weight, dependent completely on its mass, to cause it to accelerate downward at 9.8 meters per second squared. Everything falls together. So you throw out your entire, you know, take your entire uh, purse or knapsack or, or backpack, dump the whole thing out the window, everything goes down together in the absence of gravity. They all hit, hit at the same moment. Questions about that? Uh, that said, just a little bit of a, a, a side issue. Um, in reality, air is a big is a big player in the story, and we will, we will not, this semester, pursue the role of air very far. But just to point out that the dense objects, like this bowling ball, uh, cuts through the air pretty nicely and will, and will accelerate according to what I've just described for you pretty well. On the other hand, a sheet of paper, not so much. You know, you drop a sheet of paper, you know, it comes down slowly. It's, it's experiencing terrible forces of air resistance. And so it's not, it's not following the rules. The rules are for a falling object, it's experiencing only its weight. That's what a falling object is. But if it's got other things like air blowing on it, all bets are off. And um, over the years, one of the questions that I keep getting asked in various ways, often in the media, is, is uh, the penny off the Empire State Building? Surely you've heard People worry about that, and it's, you know, it ends up in plays and things like that. Throwing a penny off the Empire State Building, that it'll go so fast by the time it hits the pavement, you know, it's deadly. The, 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 the true story is no, it, it comes down more like a sheet of paper than it does like a cannonball. It has a terrible time getting through the air, it tumbles. And so it comes down at about 20 odd miles an hour. And Someone who's better at catching it than I am could catch it. I have tried. Um, for, for, a t for, a, for one particular television show, I, we went out into one of the parks with a, with a, with a helium balloon and a, and a penny dropping gadget that I'd constructed. And it would drop pennies and I would try to catch them. And they were bouncing off of me, but I could not get one in my hand. <laughs> so anyway, they're not a problem. What you worry about is things that are very compact or very aerodynamically streamlined that cut through the air well. So my concern is, is things like ballpoint pens, which will basically, if they, if they weather vane into the, into the wind, they turn, point themselves properly into the wind and, and drill down, they're probably pretty nasty. So don't throw the stuff in your handbag out the Empire State Building. The pennies I'm not worried about, it's the other stuff. Any questions? All right. So, um, th this is just asking you, 
you know the answer to this. Throw, you throw a whole handful of coins out, they're all going to hit the ground at the same moment. If they follow, if they, if they follow the same path, I've, I've now edited my bag of coins out of my collection here. But if you throw a handful of coins, they all travel together, they all hit together, same instant. Despite their differences in mass, they have the same differences in weight to correspond for it, they just travel together. Okay. Um, how would a ball fall on the moon? And the answer is it would fall more slowly. And assuming that you're not uh, among the, those who thought that the Apollo missions were staged, we, we saw all this, or I saw all this. It's a little before your time, but, but, the, but the video of, of the astronauts on the moon is exactly uh, follows the, the, the expectations. The moon, because it has much less mass than the Earth, produces a much weaker gravity. It's also physically smaller than the Earth, and therefore you are closer as an astronaut on the surface of the moon. You're closer to its center, which has the effect of increasing gravity, but, but the two effects don't cancel. Uh, the moon is so much smaller in mass, by about a factor of 100, that it, uh, it produces a weaker gravity. It turns out, finally, that, that everything produces gravity. You all produce gravity, and, and that gravity act, acts on everybody else in the room. You're attracting everybody else in the room, whether you like it or not. It's very weak. Uh, the, those forces can be observed in the laboratory, amazingly enough. You can actually see the, the, uh, the, the gravitational attraction of essentially one bowling ball for another bowling ball. It's teeny, teeny tiny, but it's there. Um, here on Earth, the only thing we really notice is the Earth's gravity. On the Moon, the only thing you really notice is the Moon's gravity, and it's, it's weak. It's about one-sixth of the Earth's gravity. And the result is that if, if uh, the, the astronauts playing games on the Moon, they, they would drop a ball, and it would fall, it would accelerate downward, but at about a sixth of the acceleration due to gravity here on Earth. So instead of being 9.8 meters per second squared, it's about 1.6 meters per second squared. Go to Jupiter, in principle, if you could stand on anything there, it's not, it's not, you know, it doesn't have a nice surface. Um, the gravity's stronger, things would fall faster, and so on. More, faster acceleration. Um, more practical uh, possibilities. The Earth, the Earth is not perfectly spherical. I hope, hope you're aware of that a little bit. I mean, the reason it's not is because it's spinning. Uh, if gravity could completely uh, had complete say, the Earth would be just a big bowling ball, perfectly smooth. Uh, the fact that it's got mountains and stuff mean it means that's already not, not quite right. But the fact that it's spinning means that it has, uh, it has a non-spherical shape, just to, just to begin with. It is flung out around the equator. So it's wider at the equator than it is at the poles. It's, what is it shaped like? It, I, you know, I, this is oblate or something, a word that barely means anything to me, let alone to you. Um, the result of that is, when you are at the equator, you are farther from the Earth's center than if you were at the poles. And that actually has an effect on your weight. You weigh more at the poles, where you're closer to the center than you do at the equator, and the difference is about a half a percent. It's not zero. No, it's not tiny. It's, it's enough that you could weigh it. So if you, if you want to lose weight effortlessly, go to the, go to the equator. <laughs> yeah, it's real. I, hey, I lost weight, man. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, it, 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 it wasn't what they had in mind. You, you can, if you want to really lose weight, fine. Just, just go out into deep space. You're now down to zero. Wow, what a great diet plan. Um, the point is that, that, that weight is a, uh, depends on location. And if you, go, if you go into the Blue Ridge, your weight will decrease by a small amount, probably not easily measured. Um, but scales, uh, are, are weigh, weighing systems have to be calibrated for the local, for the local gravity. If you really want to read it to five digits, you, you, better, you better get it set for, for this location as opposed to Santa's workshop. Uh, all right. Yeah, I could probably... There's got to be some joke about uh, the gifts coming from Santa's workshop being they're underweight when they arrive here at Charlottesville. Yeah, you know, it was supposed to be a pound of chocolate, but now it's only, uh, 
it's down to 0 0.9997, throw you in jail. All right. Some days, even it's Monday, it's already, it's already the end of the week. Um, so a little, little bit of specificity here. What happens when you drop a ball and let it fall? And do, do I care that you know all the numbers? Certainly not, but you should, but you should understand that, that when you drop a ball, it goes faster and faster with every second it's had to fall. Because what acceleration means, what an acceleration of 9.8 meters per second squared downward means, is it means that every second of falling adds an additional 9.8 meters per second of downward, of speed in the downward direction to the ball. So after one second of falling, it will have acquired, falling from rest, it will have acquired 9.8 meters per second downward. Um, I should know that in miles per hour. Can I do that? I think it's pushing already 30 miles an hour, I think. I, it, sometimes I remember these numbers and sometimes you know, they, they drift out of my head with time. But after one second, it's going 9.8 meters per second. After two seconds, it's going twice that, 19.6. After three seconds, it's going three times the original number, which is, is 29.4 meters per second. Faster and faster assuming no air resistance, which will gum that up. Um, the consequence of that for where it's located is interesting. In the first second of falling, it doesn't go very far. Why not? Because it started at rest, and it finished that second traveling up downward about 10 meters per second squared. I'm just going to approximate. 9.8 is 10. It goes from 0 to 10. Its average speed during that time was only halfway was in between was five meters per second downward. It wasn't going very fast during the first second. So if it was going on average five meters per second, that's five of these per second, it, that's all it traveled in one second. Five, five meters, not very far. 15 feet, 17 feet, 16 feet, you know, something like that. The second second, though, it goes a lot farther because it started the second already moving downward pretty fast. Well, 30 miles an hour. Um, and it finished that second second traveling downward at almost 20 meters per second. So its average speed between the start of the first second second and the end of the second second, its average speed was 15 meters per second, three times what it was in the first second. So it covers three times the distance in the second second. Ho I mean, Hopefully this is followable in the language. There are too many words. The word second shows up too often. The point of this is that if you go watching something fall, it travels much farther toward the end of its fall in time than it does at the beginning of the fall. And therefore, things that, that, that fall for only one second don't, don't make much progress. Things that fall for five seconds tra travel tremendous distances. And you know, an example of where this might might conceivably matter is go to the amusement park and there are various rides that approximately drop you. This includes some of the roller coasters, but certainly the, 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 the death plunge tower things where they, where they pull you up in a tower, right, and you sit there for a second and then they just let you go. And those drop you for typically for two seconds, give, give or take a little bit. If they only drop you for one second, you would travel about the, the height of this room, not very far. Two seconds, you drop three to, four times that far overall, because you've got two seconds to work with. The first second, you travel a certain distance. The second second, you travel three times that far. You get four times the drop in a two-second fall as you do in a one-second fall. But that's all they can deal with. Two seconds, you're now dropping, instead of the height of this room, now you're about four times the height of this room. You want to do it for three seconds, you need about nine times the height of this room. It gets big fast. So it's unlikely any amusement park will ever come up with a, one of these drop towers that, that, that drops you for three seconds or more. Too tall, unrealistically tall. The same is true of bungee jumping uh, adventures and stuff. They can't, you can't, they can't let you fall very long. If you do, you travel too far. All right? How about the, the other version of the fall? 
we, I did that, that was drop from rest. What if you drop, instead of dropping from rest and watching it go faster and faster, you start heading up. Well, in this case, the initial velocity of the ball is upward, okay? What does that do to the acceleration of a falling ball? The answer is nothing. Once the ball leaves my hand, however I threw it or just let go of it, doesn't matter. It's going to accelerate downward because of its weight, not because of me or what I did to it. And its acceleration downward is going to be 9.8 meters per second downward. That means that when I throw the ball going up, it is moving up. That's true. And that has to do with my throw and its history. But its acceleration is still the same as it was when I dropped it. 9.8 meters per second squared downward. The consequence of a downward acceleration when the ball is heading upward is that the ball slows down. That's, that's the same situation I, I was playing with the other day where I was going, I'm going to the right, but I'm accelerating the left. This is exactly what the ball is doing. But instead of doing it horizontally, the ball is doing it up and down. So the ball accelerates downward, even as it's going upward, which means it's slowing down. And how much is it slowing down? It's losing 9.8 meters per second of upwards velocity every second. So if I threw it upward at, at almost 30 meters per second, square, uh, per 30 meters per second, it would take three seconds for gravity to suck all of its upward velocity out. And, and bring it momentarily to a stop. So it would rise for three seconds. I can't throw it that hard. But you know, I can get some, some portion of one second. That isn't even a whole second before it stopped. I, can, I could get a whole second, but I'd hit the ceiling. I'd have to be careful. Um, so so the, the behavior of a rising ball is that it slows down, and therefore it covers smaller and smaller distances as it goes deeper into that trip. It travels, it covers the, the largest rise during the first second, smaller during the second second, and so on. It does come momentarily to a stop. And that momentarily to a stop can be puzzling because you might think, well, okay, it's momentarily motionless, and maybe at that moment, for some reason, its acceleration disappears. And the reality is, no, it's still, even at the very top of the motion, it's still accelerating downward up there. Acceleration is caused by a force, the weight of the ball, and that hasn't gone away. So even as the ball is rising to its peak, it's still accelerating downward. It gets to its peak, it's still accelerating downward. It begins to descend. It's accelerating downward the whole way. Um, what does happen at the top is that if you, if you were to take a, photo, a movie of, of the ball at the top and you were to play it slowly, you would notice that the ball in the early frames, so the, the ball would be, would be going upward. So it's going upward less and less between each frame. It's still moving upward, still moving upward, it's, but it's less and less because it's accelerating downward. It's losing that upward velocity. There will be one frame in which, wow, it, it reached its peak. And then the next frames, it will be starting to come down. And you'd watch that the velocity went smoothly from upward, smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, and smaller to downward faster and faster and faster and faster. It goes smoothly through that zero. And the acceleration is the same the whole way through. It's always losing upward speed or gaining downward speed. All right, uh, call that a day. The last thing I want to, I'll talk about next time is, the, is, the, is these arcs. And then we'll move on to ramps.